Hello, everybody, and welcome to the eSchool of the European Society of Sheen and Cell Therapy. My name is Hildegard Bühning, and I'm the current president of the ECCT and will share today's session. Last week, um, as you know, we heard from Axel Schambach uh, how retro and lentiviral vectors are cloned and where they are derived from and so on. And today, Els von Hoy will discuss with us how we can uh, make them better than nature and serve better for our purpose in cell and gene therapy. So it's really a pleasure to have Els von Hoyen here. And just to let you know, Els is currently the president of the French Society for uh, Cell and Gene Therapy. And she has actually two labs, one in Lyon and one in Nice. And she really dedicated her life towards uh, lentis and retroviral vectors and to understand their biology and, as I said, makes them better serving our purpose in cell and gene therapy. So Els, we are looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Hildegard, for the introduction. And I would like to welcome all of you to the ESGT uh, School uh, webinars. So I am going to talk about how we can teach the enveloped vectors to enter um, into a cell. So lentiviral vectors, as Axel uh, told you last week, um, they are uh, made from transfection of three different constructs. One, uh, which are borrowed from HIV virus, and uh, one of them is encoding for the structural and enzymatic proteins, GACPOL, and the other one is encoding for the a gene transfer vector or the viral genome in which we can introduce a reporter or we can introduce our gene of interest. And finally, and that is the emphasis of this talk, uh, we also uh, transfect a plasmid encoding for a viral glycoprotein that will modify the surface of the lenti and determine the entry into the target cell. This, is, um, this process is called uh, pseudotyping, so replacing the natural HIV envelope by, uh, for example, uh, an heterologous envelope uh, from hepatitis C virus, as you can see here, that will be specific for hepatocyte uh, transduction. In red, I've marked one, the, the pseudotypes we are going to uh, talk about today, but I just wanted to emphasize that these are uh, magnificent tools because as you can see, we also uh, in our lab were able to uh, pseudotype these lentils with a SARS-CoV-2 uh, spike protein, so the surface protein of uh, the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and it is specific, of course, for uh, airway epithelium. Um, now, pseudotyping of lentils, I think you all know that the classical factors that we use for our research in the lab and also for the clinical trials up to now uh, is mostly uh, the pseudotype with the vesicular stomatitis virus G protein. Uh, why? Because this is a vector that we can produce at very high titers. It's very um, efficient for transduction of many cell types. However, it has quite some disadvantages. It's cytotoxic, so we cannot make a stable producer cell line. And it's sensitive to human complements, so we cannot use it in vivo. And above all, we need to use high vector doses to get therapeutic efficacy. And another drawback is that we would like a lot of target cells for gene therapy, like T cells, uh, HS hematopoietic stem cells, or B cells, um, keep them in the resting state so the phenotype is not changing and get them efficiently transduced, but their PSVG is not really working. Now, it's known in a resting T cell, for example, for a long time that all the steps are slowed down, so the fusion and entry of the, of the vector with the membrane of the cell, the reverse transcription of the RNA into DNA and then the nuclear import and finally the integration are much slowed down in resting T cells. But it was only in 2013 that people found out what the receptor of the vesicular stomatitis virus was and that this might also be a limiting step. And we, uh, for that reason, looked at the receptor 
for vesicular stomatitis virus and the VSVG glycoprotein. And this is the low density lipid receptor, as you can see here. And in all these quiescent targets, which are the state in which they are in our, in our bodies, so when we isolate them freshly, they are quiescent, they don't present this receptor. And uh, due to this fact, we don't get them easily transduced. However, when we strongly stimulate them, except for B cells, we are able to have a very uh, nice uh, transduction, as you can see. So um, what we uh, would like to have, though, is to transduce these resting uh, cells because they would be much longer persisting in vivo. And that's why we definitely need uh, another pseudotype. So we need to exchange VSVG for uh, the glycoprotein of another virus. The target cells I'm going to talk about today are stem cells and progenitors as gene therapy targets, B cells and K cells and T cells. And I'm going to try to give you some examples of the value these new pseudotypes might have for, uh, for these target cells. First of all, uh, we uh, chose to pseudotype a lenti with a, a baboon retroviral endogenous uh, envelope glycoprotein. And the reason for that is it's, it's quite a resistant envelope against human complement. So one could inject it finally in vivo. But uh, the most important uh, thing is that it recognizes two uh, receptors, which are amino acid transporters, ACT1 and ACT2. And these receptors are highly present on T cells, B cells, and stem cells. So one of the problems, though, is, is that these wild-type glycoproteins are not efficiently pseudotyping the lentiviral vectors. So this might be due to a lack of compatibility between the envelope uh, glycoprotein cytoplasmic tail and the core structure of the lentiviral vector. And for this reason, we need to adapt these glycoproteins. So one of the constructs or, or the, the approaches we did is to exchange the cytoplasmic tail, for example, of the baboon envelope for the one of the marine leukemia virus envelope, because we know that this will efficiently incorporate into the lentiviral vector or we just cut a piece of the cytoplasmic tail to improve the compatibility in the second construct here. So you see that we uh, augment by this means the titer of the lenti pseudotyped with these envelopes by uh, two logs or more. Now, a second important candidate uh, was the measles virus glycoproteins. And again, their receptors are SLAM and CD46 and are present on B cells and T cells and also on hematopoietic stem cells. So um, for CD46 at least. So that's why we wanted to, to transfer the, the hemagglutinin of the measles virus, which is uh, giving the attachment to the receptor and the fusion protein of the measles virus to transfer this at the surface of a lentiviral vector and have the same tropism as the original measles virus. Again, we uh, had to do a, a reduction of the cytoplasmic tail. And as you can uh, see here, the ones that have uh, the strongest deletion of the cytoplasmic tail are incorporating efficiently on the lentiviral vectors and giving high titers. Now, um, as a target, I mentioned one of the most important cells in gene therapy is uh, the hematopoietic stem cell. And uh, the, this can mean a cure for monogenetic diseases that affect the hematopoietic system because when you correct the stem cell, you will correct all the blood cells that are derived from them. And for the moment, there are five uh, trials and many more ongoing uh, that I listed here. And I want to mention at least the last successful one because this is a disease uh, for which we were uh, already for years uh, trying to go into the clinic, the clinic Fanconi anemia. And finally, uh, we are successful also. 
Now, if we're going for the stem cell, the reason is that we will correct the whole blood, but there's a small problem because as I explained to you, we need to heavily uh, stimulate the stem cell to uh, get the receptor of VSVG expressed and have efficient transduction in the cell. However, if we put uh, stem cell factor, thromboprotein and flick tree ligand, the, the growth factors uh, in the medium of the stem cell, it will differentiate. So we will lose the stemness of the cell. So what we would like to do is to transduce a completely resting uh, cell. And uh, one of the major or the best tools for that are the measles virus pseudotyped vector. So pseudotyped with the hemagglutinin and fusion protein of measles. And as you can see here at a low uh, infectivity or, or low doses, we can have already up to 70% transduction of these cells where the classical pseudotype VSVG is not performing well at all. It helps when we do use a facilitating agent, which will approach the virus to the, the cell of interest, the hematopoietic stem cell and progenitor cells, which are uh, the CD34 plus cells. Now, to prove that we have a long-term uh, reconstituting capacity of these cells, we use a, 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 an immunodeficient mice model and uh, we transduce with our uh, lentiviral vectors, the CD34 uh, progenitor cells, human progenitor cells. And these mice are deficient in TB cells and K cells, and uh, also def deficient in functional macrophages and uh, disease. And for this reason, they accept the engraftment and develop a human blood system, which we then can uh, analyze. And the important thing here uh, to remember is that if we analyze the bone marrow of these mice, we see that we have over different uh, cell types in the bone marrow. So the early progenitors or already pro B cells and, and more mature B cells and even myelot lineage, we have the same transduction uh, levels over all these lineages, which means that we probably transduced uh, very early progenitors or stem cells. And remember, we didn't stimulate these uh, CD34 cells at all. To really prove that we have a stem cell transduced though, we have to uh, do a secondary transplantation and take the bone marrow cells from the first humanized mice with these transduced CD34s, isolate the CD34 from the bone marrow and do the round again. And in this case, we even saw an augmentation of the transduced cells uh, in the bone marrow, which means or which indicates that we have probably transduced very uh, high levels of, of stem cells. Now, a second important target are the B cells. And uh, why is this? Is because these are very powerful protein secreting cells. Remember when a B cell is activated, it can differentiate into a plasma blast and a plasma cell. And these will secrete uh, high amounts of antibodies. So the, uh, on top of that, they are tolerant. So they can induce a tolerance against the protein they secrete. And for immunotherapy, they are really interesting targets because they are very uh, highly secreting cells in terms of proteins. So what about these two pseudotypes, the baboon and the measles virus vectors? Do they transduce the B cells well? As I told you, uh, for the B cells, there's a particular problem because even if you stimulate human B cells through the B cell receptor very strongly, they are not transduced with a VSVG pseudotype. However, for the baboon and the measles virus pseudotype, we achieve very high transduction levels. And what's even better, because the quiescent B cells are also efficiently transduced by both pseudotypes, where VSVG is uh, refractory completely, um, we, uh, these targets are important because of the fact that these are uh, quiescent and can induce better tolerance against the proteins they they secrete. Now, we uh, established a model in the lab where we can induce B cells to differentiate 
into these plasma cells in vivo. We, uh, for that reason, isolated human B cells and human CD4 cells from the same donor. We transduced the B cells with a baboon and floc lentiviral vector and then infused both uh, populations into the NSG mice, which will uh, then in this model be pushed towards plasma cell uh, differentiation. And as you can see here, uh, the plasma cells that have developed in these humanized mice uh, are uh, really showing high level transduction overall. And the three populations are highly transduced, activated on plasma cells. So as an application, we thought it would be uh, a possibility to, there would be a possibility to use these B cells to treat hemophilia B. This is a blood clotting disorder, as you probably know, and it's um, inherited X-linked recessive disorder due to a mutation in the factor IX gene. Now, why would we like to target the B cells? Because they secrete, of course, uh, proteins in high levels, but they can differentiate into long-lived plasma cells, which mean that we could hope for a long-lasting delivery of a trench gene and at the same time induction of tolerance against this protein. So another reason why it might be interesting is that if we only reach 5% of the normal level of this uh, clotting factor, we um, we can uh, have already an effect in the clinic. So this is the construct that we used to transduce the B cells. As I explained before, uh, the B cells transduced with a baboon vector encoding for factor IX uh, was, uh, were infused together with autologous CD4 cells. And then when we looked into the serum of these mice, we had high level of uh, secretion of factor IX in the serum of the humanized mice, up to 80% of the normal level of a human. So um, this might be an option for uh, certain uh, applications like, like this one. Of course, we also have applications where we want to secrete cross-neutralizing antibodies against, for example, hepatitis C virus, which is another application uh, we uh, showed in the lab. Now, what about T cells? Um, T cells are important targets. And how are they transduced with these two uh, different pseudotypes? Um, the specific application for T cell gene therapy I'm going to talk about is chimeric antigen uh, receptor uh, T cells. I think you all know that for hemato hematological malignancies, these were very successful and two uh, therapies have been approved now. Um, here, we, um, we see that, as I showed before, that for VSVG, um, when we stimulate the T cells very strongly through the TCR, we have a high level transduction, which is uh, even a little bit higher or equalized by the baboon or the measles virus vector. But what's more important, if we don't want to change the phenotype of our T cells through a mild stimulation with survival cytokine IL-7, for example, uh, you can see that we will have an augmentation with the baboon or the HF vectors compared to uh, VSVG. So this might be a very good candidate for modifying T cells with CAR Ts and keeping their naive state or stem state. Now, T cells are uh, very successful, as I said, for B cell leukemias. And um, when we express the CAR, as you see here on the picture, uh, on the, on the T cells, it consists of a single chain fragment from an antibody that will recognize an antigen on the tumor cell. Uh, in, for example, B cell malignancies, it's very often CD19 or CD22, for example. And this is connected with two co-stimulatory domains and it's a CD3 zeta domain, which will induce the signaling to kill the tumor cell and to increase the number of these uh, CAR positive T cells. Now, we don't 
have to forget that this is a therapy where the autologous T cells are modified. So this is a very personal uh, thera personalized therapy and we have to have a, a high expansion ex vivo of these T cells, which we might modify their phenotype. So all this together makes that this very costly therapy and it's not uh, so accessible for all the patients. So one of the solutions for this would be to use uh, natural uh, killer cells expressing CARS. Why would we like to do that? Because they have an intrinsic ability to recognize and kill uh, tumor cells. And they also have, um, a, when we would express a chimeric antigen receptor on these NK cells, that this would still improve their anti-cancer uh, capacities. Now, NKs can be used in analogenic settings. So it would be a much lower cost compared to CAR T cells, where you have to use autologous T cells. So we would have an off-the-shelf product that can be used and, uh, for, for many different patients. However, again, here the problem arises, if we compare it to T cells that we stimulate, a VSVG lentiviral vector transduces T cells very effectively. However, and K cells are very uh, little uh, transduced. So when we then uh, used the baboon envelope pseudotyped uh, lenti, you can see that the efficacy of transduction here is uh, for an MOI of 10, about 70% for T cells, but also for NK cells. So this would uh, really open uh, the way for NK CAR T cell therapy and make it much easier to get this uh, into the clinic. We have, uh, of course, looked if this was uh, a, a possibility uh, to have a CAR, CAR against CD22, which is uh, expressed on B cell malignancies. Uh, if we get a high transaction level of these NKs and we reach, uh, as you can see, as for a GFP vector, easily uh, 60 to 70 percent. And these uh, NK cells are, as you can see, without a car already functional uh, towards the killing of uh, B cell acute uh, lymphocyte leukemia. But if we express the CD22 car, we augment the the killing capacity of these uh, NKs significantly. Now, um, just to summarize, we were able to transduce a resting stem cell, a resting uh, T cell or a very lowly uh, um, activated T cell. We were able to transduce NK cells and B cells, which are highly refractory to VSVG uh, transduction in a resting state or even a stimulated state. And we've also shown that we can transduce uh, pre T cells, uh, but I'm not going to talk about this today. Um, one important thing I wanted to also uh, tell you is that we are able to transduce also uh, nowadays very specifically certain uh, cell types because the baboon factors and the measles factors, they can transduce nevertheless, uh, many different cell types. But what we like to do is to in vivo be able to, for example, modify only a CD8 positive T cell. And for this reason, uh, we use uh, a NIPA uh, G uh, glycoprotein, uh, which is the protein that recognizes the receptor. And we blinded it for the natural attachment to its receptors. And then we have the fusion protein, which will allow virus to cell fusion. Now, this is the reason why this, uh, glyco, these um, glycoproteins can be easily manipulated because the fusion is separated from the receptor binding function. What we, uh, the lab of Christian did was actually uh, putting the single chain antibody uh, inside the G protein of the NIPA uh, virus glycoprotein and uh, targeted in this way uh, two CD8 positive uh, T cells. To test these vectors, um, 
we wanted to go in vivo and uh, we wanted to see if it would be possible to generate in vivo CAR T cell, uh, CD8 positive T cells for B cell leukemia, for example. And what would be the advantages of this? I think, uh, as I already mentioned for an, an, an case uh, before, there are a lot of advantages. If you don't have this ex vivo culture process, uh, you would maybe also not exhaust the T cells. So they might persist longer in vivo if you can modify them directly uh, on the site of action. And this would of course also lower the cost of the therapy uh, tremendously. So what we did is we humanized to test this uh, possibility. We humanized with CD34, uh, immunodeficient, uh, not skit uh, mice, and we injected um, a vector pseudotyped with a CD8 targeting uh, G glycoprotein and encoding for a CAR against 19. And when we injected this IV in the humanized mice, what uh, is the result? As you can see here, uh, this factor uh, after injection, between seven and 80 weeks, it was quite variable according to the, to the animal. You can see in the blood that only the CD8 cells, the CD8 T cells carry the, the car, as you can see here. Also in the spleen and the bone marrow, this was evident. And of course, these uh, CD8 uh, T cells should uh, kill the B cells. As you can see here, that in comparison in the blood with 30%, you have only 0.5% left. Uh, so these CD8 uh, cells are really functional in vivo. As uh, a result, these cells were able to modify in vivo in this humanized mice, the CDAs for car expression and kill off the B cells. As a last part, I would like to uh, talk about a new tool that we developed uh, for gene editing in hematopoietic cells, uh, which are the nanoblades. And they are derived from uh, lentiviral or neuron retroviral vectors, uh, as I will explain you. So, um, for gene editing, I think uh, we most, most of you know that we now uh, use very often the uh, CRISPR-Cas9 uh, system, which is a very flexible uh, system to target the enzyme that is going to cut the genome uh, towards a specific uh, target uh, locus into the genome. And in that way, we can easily get uh, knockouts for certain genes. Now, um, if we go for gene editing in hematopoietic stem cells, uh, this is already a little bit more difficult because we could go for lentiviral vectors, for example, uh, that express Cas9 and the guide RNA in the same construct, but these vectors have low titers. Um, we uh, might have a persistent expression of Cas9, which induces an immune response and might be toxic in the end. And it's quite difficult, as I told you, to transduce with a VSVG lenti, uh, normally hemopoietic stem cells, but as you now know, we can use other uh, pseudotypes to do that. The second method that one uh, is currently using is uh, the association of the Cas9 protein with the guide RNA and uh, electroporate this complex into the HSC, but this has quite a level of uh, toxicity because electroporation is a harsh method to modify uh, these cells. So that is why we thought of a system uh, where we actually uh, borrow the structural uh, protein uh, of, the, of a lenti or a, an MLV vector. And to the GAG, we actually fused, so GAG is the one that is encoding for the structural proteins and making up the core of the vector. We fused to that Cas9, and in that way, embarked Cas9 into the particle as a, a protein. And this Cas9 is associated with the guide RNAs that are uh, in, inside the, the particle at the same time with, associated with the Cas9. So uh, this was developed with uh, Philippe Mongeau and Emiliano 
Ricci. And of course, this, our specialty was to, to prototype this kind of uh, carriers of the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, system. So this uh, asks for a, a co-transfection of nine of, for example, here, um, five different constructs, one for the GAC Cas9, one for the native GAC pole, then one for the guide RNA. And then here you can see that I used two envelopes, uh, which is peculiar, but the reason why we did this, I cannot go into this in detail now, but is that when we sort of typed these nanoblades only with VSVG or only with a baboon envelope, we got very low incorporation of Cas9 associated with the guides. Um, and of course, the double uh, expression might allow binding to the receptor of the baboon uh, envelope, ACT1, ACT2, and uh, VSVG to the LDL receptor, augmenting the entry. But definitely the co-expression uh, embarked much more uh, Cas9 with guides into these particles. And here is a demonstration of this because when we were targeting GFP uh, in a, a cell line that was stably uh, expressing GFP, you can see that when we co-pseudotyped co with VSVG and the baboon vector that we had a higher De decrease of the GFP fluorescence because the guide is directed against uh, exon one of GFP and will uh, make the, the cell line GFP knockout. Finally, how does it perform in the CD34 cells? When we activate the CD34 cells for a very short period and we incubate it for 80 hours with the nanoblades, in this case, the target is uh, the mid-88 gene. And we, ins we can uh, embark as many guides as we want because this system is quite uh, flexible. Uh, you can see that uh, after, uh, insert after insertion and cutting uh, at two places by two different guides that uh, guide the Cas9 to these locus, that we have a reduction uh, of the fragments that we amplify by PCR. And as you can see here, this uh, gives uh, an achievement of 80% of deletion in uh, almost uh, or, or very uh, little cultured uh, human CD34, all in the hope of course of not influencing the stemness of these cells. So just to sum up very rapidly, uh, it's a, a very flexible system with a rapid transfer and a mild transfer to the cells of Cas9 and the guides. There's no encoding material inside these particles. It's only proteins and RNA. So it's a hit and run system and uh, off target uh, is quite low uh, as we have shown and low toxicity, of course, because it's like a simple uh, infection with a lentiviral vector. Um, and we can embark a lot of guides at the same time uh, if we want to do that. Just a summary slide, which I'm not going to go into, but to see how much targets these pseudotypes have uh, opened to the research field and hopefully also to uh, gene therapy. Thank you very much. And I... Thank you very much, uh, Els, for this beautiful overview. And I encourage all uh, our listeners also to contribute to the chat. So we have already two questions. So uh, there's a question stating, are there efficacy concerns with using measles pseudotyped lentivirus in patients because a lot of people are immunized against measles? Yes, this is definitely uh, not the right way to, to go for uh, in vivo, you will not be able to use measles uh, because uh, as you say, everybody is vaccine, vaccinized and we have a huge, uh, this is a vaccination by the way, that's working really, really well. And we have a huge amount of uh, antibodies uh, in patients that are vaccin vaccinated. However, 
uh, of the same family. That's why we derived for in vivo applications and targeting of specific uh, cells to the Nipah uh, viruses because there they are not pre-existing immunities uh, against these uh, envelopes, and we can uh, we have we have not to face that problem, and they are also pretty uh, resistant to complement, as far as I know. Thanks. Elena is, uh, is uh, really happy with your work, saying amazing work. And uh, she is asking, did your group try to pseudotype nanoblades with mesoglycoproteins as well? And if not, why? It's a very good question. And I think it's a way I, I, I try to provoke it a little bit because it's uh, clear that we can uh, try to do this. And I think in a system, uh, where we can target T cells uh, in vivo, uh, this will be a magnificent way to have uh, a T cell blinded for a certain characteristic. And probably we can use this in combination, for example, to uh, reduce, uh, for example, uh, the expression of PD-1 on the cells uh, to have a immune checkpoint uh, inhibition uh, avoided. But uh, for the moment, we are actively trying to pseudotype uh, and there is no real um, barrier that says us that this will not work to pseudotype these nanoblades with a lot of different uh, targeting uh, molecules or different envelopes. Beatrice is also looking into your nanoblades and is asking if you can also insert then DNA, so knock in. Um, yes, I was not able to talk about this now, but um, what we uh, have done uh, in the past, and this is working really, really uh, good in cell lines, is you can just uh, put your donor DNA uh, with homology uh, ends, you can just stick it to the surface of the nanoblaze. And this will really efficiently work to have, a, like, um, to tag, for example, a certain protein in the endogenous locus. But of course, you can imagine that if the target uh, is getting, or the cassette you want to insert is getting bigger, the efficiency is going down. For primary cells, um, I think uh, this will be more uh, difficult to achieve. And what we have shown, for example, for uh, CD34 cells is that when you combine the nanoblades with an AV vector or an AV6 vector or an AV2, we could use two, as Hildegard would confirm, uh, these, um, these are able to efficiently bring in the donor and the nanoblades at the same time uh, will cut and give a, an efficient insertion. And we can get up to 30, 40% of homologous recombination in the cells by this means in uh, CD34 cells. So this is quite a good uh, efficiency. Uh, so Carsten is also um, very happy with the talk. So he also said it's a great talk. And uh, he has a question for you. What suggests to you that co-expression of BRL and VSVG improves GFP knockdown by better incorporation of SG RNAs rather than by more efficient transfer of both HEC293T and macrophage target cells? Um, I must admit that we are not in the clear if uh, probably in at least in primary cells, I suspect that uh, both the receptors for VSVG and for uh, baboon might be important, but I think that the VSVG might be important for embarking more uh, Cas9, while the baboon might allow more entry. The reason for that is, is that the collaborator with whom we set up the system, he developed also what is called jessicles. Mm -hmm. And these jessicles easily, uh, so VSVG is, is naturally associating to particles, which can, if you overexpress a certain protein, embark a, a big amount of protein. Mm -hmm. 
So I think that the VSVG is more helping on the Cas9 side, while the baboon maybe uh, is more helping on the entry into primary uh, cells. This will not be so prominent, of course, in cell lines where, where VSVG is already uh, transducing very well normally. So we stick to your nanoparticles or nanoblades. So Enrico is asking, how does the nanoblades compare to lipid nanoparticle mediated delivery of the CRISPR-Cars RNPs? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. For um, primary cells, uh, we have uh, not uh, shown this yet. So we are looking into this. For uh, cell lines, it seems that um, the nanoparticles are a little bit um, better and they also have, as I mentioned, uh, less of targets. The reason for this is not completely clear, but we have totally compared this in, uh, and this is also published uh, in the publication I mentioned there, so. Um, so David is uh, asking uh, again with regards to what you can further do with your uh, nanoblades. So the question is, I'm interested if nanoblades might be used for delivery of genome integrating marker genes. So he was thinking about fluorescence proteins or antibiotic resistance. Yes, 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 definitely. I think that we, um, at least if you if you thinking of uh, different uh, cell types, also primary cells, um, as we have shown, and I think as long as your insert is not too uh, too big, because uh, if I understand it well, what you want to do is to put a reporter under an endogenous promoter in the locus. So this will not be enormous. It might even work by just. Uh, sticking the double-stranded uh, linearized cassette at the surface of the nanoblades. At least it's worth uh, the try. And uh, you can also, if you uh, in, uh, put a, a cassette for a resistance, of course you can select for the clones that are having the, the, the pure resistance cassette inserted endogenously. So Marianne is also um, sticking to the nanoblades and um, goes even further asking if nanoblades, uh, how easy will it be to transfer them to the clinic regarding upscaling and immune responses? Even if pre-existing immunity is excluded, uh, will repeated administration be feasible? That is a very good question uh, for which I cannot completely answer, but what is true though is that all the systems or all the upscaling that is clear uh, can be um, of course uh, applied to the nanoblades. Uh, the reproducibility is uh, although we transfect five different constructs, and you could probably reduce that, is uh, quite, quite reproducible, the one from one prep to the other. Uh, there is a variability, but this is for CRISPR-Cas9 known according to the target that you, the guide and the target locus, uh, mm -hmm. that is for sure. So I think that, that the, the scaling up would not be so difficult because we can rely on everything that is already uh, already there. And the second part of the question. The was, question was re-administration. Um, even yes. if you can, pre-existing immunity can be excluded. What about repeated administration if this is necessary? Uh, that is a very good question. And I don't think I really can answer this because it's the same um, problem we have with uh, probably uh, targeting vectors, you cannot uh, forget that these humanized mice model that we used in which, for example, we injected the CD8 targeted uh, vectors uh, is not fully uh, immunocompetent. And I really think that we need to go to a preclinical uh, model like a macaque or at least um, the, these mice models that uh, have the T cells educated on a human uh, thymic tissue. 
Um, we are leaving now the nanoblades and Ariso is asking um, using VSVG envelope in NK transduction that almost all papers and also yours uh, report about low efficacies in gene delivery and the question would be uh, which are the important elements uh, that could impact on gene delivery. Would it be it's the second part of the question, would it be the envelope, the transduction um, and hen enhance the nature of the insert? Yeah. So uh, definitely what, what we've shown in, in those, or my collaborators have shown in those two papers is that uh, NK cells uh, do not express the receptor efficiently for VSVG. So again, the LDL receptor is uh, absent. So although these pseudotypes are efficient for so many cell types, the immune cells, at least uh, in the way we want to transduce them, don't express the receptor for VSVG so highly. And another thing is that we can transduce uh, freshly isolated NKs up to 30% with a baboon envelope, but you definitely need this uh, facilit facilitating agent. It can be another one. There, there are several on the market that can be tested, I think. But it seems to be very important for this baboon uh, envelope to approach its receptors, ACT1 and ACT2, to be really uh, in the neighborhood to permit transduction. And then again, uh, how do we come to this 80 or 70% is because we stimulate with uh, IL-15 and other cytokines and even on feeder layers, these NKs. So um, they get activated more and they express higher levels of these amino acid transporters, ACT1 and AC 2 This is also uh, clear from, from the publication. So you can have a look. So I don't see any further questions. No. So then again, I will. I really would like to to thank you. It was a wonderful lecture, great talk, yeah. and uh, I, I would like to remind uh, all our listeners that next week we will hear about adenoviral vector gene delivery tool, powerful weapon in cancer and beyond from Len Seymour. And again, thank you, Els, for a wonderful talk. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.